Identity is something that's been really interesting to me lately. What's crazy is that we stereotype ourselves by observing ourselves behave in certain ways, and we eventually conclude that this is who we are, that we are some identity. And this effect is compounded when you factor in other people's stereotypes of you as well. So for example, if you were a person who kept making mistakes when you first meet some group of people, maybe even your family, you will eventually be labeled as this person who frequently makes mistakes and you will be expected to make mistakes. And that means that what the, the amount of effort you'd have to put in to not make mistakes is actually reduced. You are no longer held at a high standard. So there's already a problem there. The other problem would be that you now, uh, you, you will be looked at as inferior in some sense. And I think this is crazy because we, we have to explore through trial and error. And if error is shamed or punished, then we cannot easily do this. We actually would have to basically just adopt what other people have learned through trial and error. And, and I think that's kind of problematic because those who are more exploratory, they will be uh, shamed for all of the errors that they make on their learning path. And then it can even get to the point where um, this person may come out and say that they've discovered something through their explorations and those around them will have a bias to not believe them because they expect that person to be making errors. They will be hypercritical of this person. And this person will likely notice this. And I think there's a few ways that that can go down. I think that if you were to reject this identity that people have imposed on you, this mistake maker identity, I think that will cause people to... Um, see you as arrogant. You are telling others that they are wrong in their assessment of who you are and that their assessment is that you are making mistakes, right? And so that would mean that your assessment is that you are not making so much mistakes, that you are actually uh, have great ideas or something like that. So that can come off as arrogant and grandiose if you were to defend your, um, uh, the things that you've discovered through exploration. And you could go the alternative route and accept that you are, um, essentially a failure and that you do make mistakes and then you can start being self-critical and, um, constantly doubt your own ideas. Now, another way that I've seen this play out is through veganism, when uh, there is a lot of stereotypes for vegans. And when I went vegan, I noticed that these stereotypes would be applied to me completely inappropriately. Um, so for example, I would, I, I was not very invested when I first went vegan. It was a kind of experiment and I, didn't know anything about the health benefits, and when I would read studies about the health benefits, I would tell some of my friends that I talk about science with, and they were very paranoid that I was trying to convert them and manipulate them. They thought, I've had people accuse me of being too invested, that I was obsessed, or that I had some kind of agenda, and it was crazy because I was actually very paranoid that being vegan was a bad idea. So it was kind of interesting because it was completely not true. And I didn't, I make sure not to bring up these things in some kind of like, I don't know, like I wasn't trying to 
assert any kind of superiority or anything. But this is a common stereotype, and because it's a common stereotype of this vegan superiority thing, then people who find out that you're vegan will actually form this confirmation bias and expect and look for these kind of traits. And the thing is, we all have these kind of traits and like the mere fact that I'm making the decision to try veganism or let's say once I got to the point of deciding that it was what I thought was best for me, um, I mean, I'm not making this choice because I specifically think it's a bad idea. Most, most of the time people don't do that. People don't purposely try to make bad, bad decisions, right? So if someone's making a decision, just this inherently will show that, um, that they believe what they're doing might be a better idea than doing other things. And you can say that that's a superiority thing, but that applies to everybody. Everybody is doing things that they think are the best choices to make for the most part. That might not account for everybody, but you get the idea. And so I find this particularly distressing in a way, I guess. But, but what I've noticed is that a lot of these symptoms that occur from being kind of an outgroup or being um, suddenly different from others, like by becoming the vegan, you are kind of outcasting yourself from those who aren't. And a lot of the stereotypes on vegans are very similar to the stereotypes that we call schizophrenia, which is really interesting to me. That's something I study a lot. And so what happens is, okay, for example, a person labeled vegan is has the stereotype of having a superiority complex. And that's essentially symptoms of grandiosity. And you could even decide that the whole vegan ideology is crazy and call it delusional. And a lot of it can fall in line with what we would consider as schizophrenia. And this really got me thinking because, okay, let me, let me give you an example of something. So imagine you're a vegan at a dinner party and you're the only vegan. You're surrounded by six other non-vegans, let's say. It would be very easy for this group of people to kind of subtly gang up on you or for you to worry that they're ganging up on you. And I think even acting worried and identifying with that worry will actually make you more likely to be ganged up upon. I, I think if you accuse people of ganging up on you, they will attempt to justify that their actions are not wrong. And so, so if you accuse someone they will try to rationalize that they're not wrong and you will come off as paranoid. But, um, but anyways, with this conflict at the dinner table, you could imagine that the vegan will have a tendency to get defensive because they have no other support on their side of the fence. If anyone brings up veganism, it's over. You're going to be teamed up and that's gonna make you feel very weird, right? And so what I've been realizing is that the more popular something like veganism gets, the less schizophrenic it will seem. And, and I've noticed that these signs of defensiveness, they occur on both sides of the fence. I've noticed that non-vegans are particularly defensive and paranoid, as I've already kind of shown with when I brought up stuff to my friends. They can assume you have some secret plot or that, and in many cases, vegans are trying to convert people, but there's also people who are trying to justify that their choice to be vegan is not crazy. And even something like that can be uh, seen as, uh, as conversion, but that gets really fuzzy and paranoid and all that kind of stuff. But I think what I've noticed is that, let's say you have three versus five, the people who are on three, the three side of things will feel 
more uh, worried about being dominated by the ideas of the five others, or the, the yeah, the five others. And so um, there might be some paranoia, distrust, and worry about this dynamic, but imagine if it was one verse 100, then you will be very worried that people are going to gang up on you, bully you, invalidate your opinions, and all that kind of stuff. You will doubt your own opinions because everyone else in the world seems to think you're wrong. So what are the chances that you're right? And if you are right, that would mean that you're like some kind of genius or something, right? That would be strange. And then that's grandiosity. That's a symptom of schizophrenia. And so I imagine it like with a one verse 100, you, you could quickly imagine like the one being like, back off, get, get away. I, I have a knife. I'm prepared to defend myself, don't touch me. Like that kind of thing, right? That typical schizophrenic stereotype. And I think what happens is that in history, we would have um, small local groups uh, where memes and ideas would kind of pool together and they don't have that much ability to expand past their area of influence. And so I think stuff like religions and stuff like that, you'd have like these ideas that pool together and people wouldn't really um, deviate from them. But if you were, especially because there's no way to, your uh, circle of influence will be uh, within that pool. You're not getting ideas from outside the pool, but if you were to get ideas from outside the pool, that would make you likely to um, undergo a psychotic effect. So that's particularly interesting because foreigners are actually more likely to experience schizophrenia than non-foreigners. And some of the genes even that link to migration tendency and the tendency to travel are linked to schizophrenia. But also these genes are linked to an openness trait, which I think predisposes you to exploring ideas that'll make you more likely to deviate from these cultural norms. And I think this tendency of, of schizophrenic behavior actually has more to do with, with disagreement. I think it's a normal response to disagreement, like conflict, ideological conflict and the the real problem is when you are the only person with your ideology that is what I think leads to the schizophrenia you can go into denial about uh, whether these ideas are true and I think a lot of the definitions of schizophrenia historically were uh, describing people that had beliefs that differed from their social sphere of influence, that they are not memeing the same memes as everyone else. And I think this is particularly relevant right now in society. We are now having the internet, which has vastly broadened our sphere of influence. It's basically internationalized our sphere of influence and our ideas. Our ideas can now spread across the internet at essentially light speed. Now, what I think is happening to society is that essentially everyone is undergoing a kind of psychotic process. Now we can see that all of our ideas were different from each other. We see how much conflict that we have. We see how many different perspectives there are and I think that this is what's happening in society right now. The hostility, the defensiveness on the internet, the trolling, I think all of these behaviors are essentially the same thing as what schizophrenia is on some level. I think uh, it's not exactly the same. I think that schizophrenia a lot of the time is more going to be like a person who's just withdrawn from society because of the conflict, that they no longer wish to face it and they just kind of hide in their isolated little rooms or whatever and then go crazy and stuff like that. But, and clearly with the internet, people are still interacting, but I think the kind of persecution and defensiveness and 
all of this kind of traits on the internet, they they are kind of like a prodrome of the schizophrenic symptoms. And I would get worried that if the response to the internet for all of society is to become increasingly withdrawn, and this is what a lot of people have been predicting, that uh, that kind of does mirror the schizophrenic tendency. And I think we need to reevaluate what it means to be crazy. I don't think crazy exists. I think what does exist is a difference in ideas that, and, and we should really tone back what we are willing to describe as true and describe as delusional. And, and this is why, this is why I often talk about solipsism because when we, we don't really even know what is true. We don't know uh, for example, in sciences, a lot of things are faked, and a lot of things, there's stuff like p-hacking, where scientists, there's, there's incentives to find significant uh, correlations to get money, and so there's a tendency to bias and do research that will have significant correlations, and stuff like that, and I think so much of our worldview is probably tainted by a lot of these biases. Like just even what I'm telling you right now about schizophrenia is an example of this. Like we could take, I, I like to use this metaphor. If we look at a person running, we see a person running and what if the rest of society doesn't engage in running? No one exercises or something like that. And then we see this strange guy running, and we wonder what that person is doing. And let's say we don't ask the person. Let's say it's not a situation like that, because in schizophrenia, I don't think asking people <laughs> really works, you know? But, um, so there's this running person, and then we do clinical tests. We check their hormones, their uh, blood, we... Um, check their heart rate, their blood pressure, stuff like this. And then we find differences in people who are not running. And then what if we conclude that these altered hormones cause the behavior of running? Because that's really where we are at with psychiatry right now. That's the level of, of problematic assessment that we've gotten to. We, we understand stuff like depression more easily because we've all experienced this for the most part. We might not understand a particularly increased state of depression because it might be less common, it might be on the far end of the bell curve, but we can still relate to it on some level. But then there's the schizophrenia thing, which is essentially defined by someone being very far on the bell curve to the point that it's causing some set of symptoms. This person is by definition hard to relate with. And I think this is the key to everything with schizophrenia. I think it is a deficiency in empathy. I think that it, if you look at the research, there's a lot of correlations that show that all schizophrenia comes down to is deviations from the norm. Uh, even things out of your control, like hearing impairment or physical deformities can predispose you to schizophrenia. Even being uh, African American in a society that is predominantly white, being homosexual in a society that is against homosexuality. I bet you that atheism among a Christian society would follow the same trend. And so, this is what we come to. I think it is a deficiency of love. And I think that we need to really reevaluate what it means to be schizophrenic. And I think we have now been faced with a massive problem, the internet, which is going to make it harder for us to all relate to each other because we are so exposed to a massive amount of information 
that we can't possibly all be homogeneous anymore. We are reaching a society of heterogeneity, and this will cause us to increasingly become psychotic. And that is all for today. I hope this idea was interesting. Please check out my content that is on mad.science.blog. I work endlessly hard to do this work. I research almost constantly. I am pretty poor. I'm a, uh, so it would really help to get these ideas out there because I think these are going to become very relevant in the near future in the direction that society is going due to the internet. I think there's a few ways it could pan out. Everyone can become increasingly withdrawn and we all experience a kind of schizophrenic uh, epidemic. Or eventually we are going to homogenize and reach a state where we have consumed so much information that we can all agree on some new consensus worldview that is no longer localized to a small sphere of influence, a global um, consensus of sorts. But I think the path to that is going to take a long time, and we're more likely to experience a kind of breakdown before then. And I think we should radically revolutionize the way that we view mental health before it gets to that point especially to those who suffer the most, those who will be at the bottom of these social hierarchies, the bottom where they have no support or who are already isolated, because that's really what it means to be isolated, right? That's when you are the one versus everyone, and paranoia becomes a justified response. And so, uh, please stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, peace out.